So if, if you want to do spiritual warfare, you know what the best thing you can do? Share Jesus. Don't go looking for those, you know, dark alleys and you're going <laughs> to whoop up on some demon. You, uh, that, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. But you know what you can do? You can share Jesus with somebody. You can talk about the application of the, of the message. Hey, if you accept Christ, you're going to have eternal life forever. If you accept Christ, you're going to have forgiveness of sins. Your, your sin and your shame is going to be gone. You're going to be cleansed. You're going to have a clean conscience. You're going to have power from the Holy Spirit. See what I'm talking about? Isn't that, that's powerful there. That's what changes lives. Good morning. I invite you to get out your study outlines as we look at Acts chapter 19, verses 8 through 22. But once you have that, you've got your outline. If you have your Bible, uh, I'd like you to turn to Ephesians chapter 6, if you'd like to. I'd like to read verses uh, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, Paul wrote Ephesians chapter 6. Well, the whole book of Ephesians is written to the church in Ephesus. And today as we look at specifically what he dealt with in Ephesus, uh, these verses make even more sense. Uh, in, my, in my studies, you know, the uh, book of Ephesians have always been one of my favorites. But going back and really looking in depth as to what Paul dealt with uh, in uh, Ephesus, it kind of all comes together. And it really shows us what a very difficult time he had in Ephesus. Uh, it underlines the spiritual battle that he was in as he was sharing the gospel in Ephesus. And so Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12, uh, you've, you've probably read it many times, but as you read this and then we move over to the book of Acts, it's going to go, wow, this, uh, this, I really understand what Paul was writing uh, when he wrote this. Uh, Paul writes in verse 10 in Ephesians chapter 6, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places." Well, before, if you're just reading the book of Ephesians, you go, okay, he's just talking about spiritual warfare. But this is exactly what he was encountering as we're now going to look at Ephesians, uh, ch excuse me, Acts chapter 19, specifically verses 8 through 22. And specifically, we're going to see the spiritual warfare that he uh, was engaged in with the uh, magicians and the evil spirits and uh, all that he had to deal with. But then as we move on to the big riot scene, which we're going to, uh, I think, pick up in two weeks, we're going to see that actually the, the physical conflict, as he said here, our, our, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. So he knows that his uh, struggle uh, with all that was, gonna go, was going on was really a spiritual battle behind the scenes. Even though there were people involved, it was a spiritual battle. So that kind of uh, sums up and kind of uh, gives us the background as we look at this passage when kingdoms collide. So again, if you'll remember Ephesus, uh, as you look at uh, Acts chapter 19, as we move on to verses uh, 8 through 22, uh, the first couple opening verses, Paul uh, paints some very broad strokes of the brush, kind of showing what he was doing. Uh, one of the things that he, we're going to see here again, that he, all, as he always did, he always went to the synagogue and preached there. Now, of course, there was probably a lot of Jews there because if you remember, that city had over 250,000 people. 
So there were, there were, it was a large synagogue with uh, lots of Jews that were there. And uh, uh, remember his first visit on his first missionary uh, trip, he enjoyed uh, a lot of success and they wanted him to come back. So he did come back. So uh, now that he was here, uh, it's interesting when you kind of see how God's timing is like, uh, he didn't stay there, but he went back over to you know, Europe and Greece and Corinth and that whole, that whole area over there. So the gospel could be planted because God knew that, it, that this was a real toehold. Ephesus was a real toehold of the devil. Again, it was a very dark and evil place. And it's going to become even more apparent as we look at these, uh, these verses here. In chapter 19, 18, uh, 8 through 22. So first of all, in verses 8 through 10, we see Paul's preaching, his persecution, and his perseverance. And it says, and he entered the synagogue and he continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. So here again, he, who is he talking to? He's talking to the Jews. Now notice the three verbs there. You might want to... Uh, highlight him or underline him. He was speaking out boldly, he was reasoning, and he was persuading. So speaking out boldly, in other words, he was uh, speaking, uh, not just teaching to a few, but he was like preaching, uh, speaking very boldly about, again, how Jesus Christ fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies and that he is God's son. Then reasoning, uh, again, he's trying to show them the differences uh, between what they believe and what Christianity believed. That he was reasoning, pointing out the, the differences of opinion of, of what was truth versus what they were believing. And then persuading, he was trying to convince them, saying, hey, you guys are going in the wrong direction. You, you really need to understand and ask God to open your mind. So he was very actively sharing the gospel. He was having conversations with people. He was teaching people. And so the reasoning and the persuading was very much, again, if you can get people down to the nuts and bolts of the gospel about, you know, Jesus and he's God's son and, and, the, and about sin and Christ's death and how you personally have to receive it, you know, once you're reasoning with people and, and helping them to understand the personal relationship with God, then it starts to make sense. Well, this is exactly what he was doing. And then verse 9, it says, But some were becoming hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the people, and he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. So, again, the three things we see here, uh, again, Luke is painting broad uh, strokes with his, his pen here as he writes. If, look how he describes what's going on there. Number one, uh, they were becoming hardened. Uh, the Jews' hearts were becoming hardened to what they were hearing. It was like, well, we don't want to believe this. We don't hear this. Um, it means to be stubborn, uh, a sense of refusing to believe, uh, unyielding. They were resisting. They were disobedient. Now, the idea of when it says they were disobedient, it means they refused to believe. In the Bible, it talks about people being disobedient. Well, it means they're refusing to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. They're being disobedient because God wants everyone by their choice to accept Christ. Now, last of all, it says uh, the verb means to insult. And it's a particularly in, uh, strong verb. Uh, they were insulting in an unjustified manner. They were speaking evil things that were not true uh, about the way. Now, the way... Uh, is a term used of the early Christian church uh, because, it, in other words, Christianity was a way of life. Uh, the way it's, it's the road. The, the word in, in Greek is, uh, means road. In other words, Christianity is the road or the way in which we are to live our lives. So that's why they're called the way. But I do want to tell you there are, I'll, I'll just go ahead and basically call them a cult. There is a cult, I don't even know if they still exist today, but they're called the way. Uh, and they are not a basic evangelical Bible-believing group. And so uh, when, if you hear that group today, somebody called The Way, uh, they're usually uh, shown that they're different from the regular Christian church today. But back then, that's what the early Christians uh, called uh, the church. Uh, let's see, but it goes on to say, that he withdrew from them and took away the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Now, 
history tells us, and kind of from reading the writings of what was going on in Ephesus, the Ephesians usually did their heavy work in the morning hours. And so and they rested from about 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. I don't know if you want to call it kind of a siesta. Uh, but they uh, worked hard. And then in the hot of the day, I mean, they worked in the morning and they rested from that uh, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. So apparently Tyrannus uh, was a teacher and he owned a lecture hall and he probably taught his classes early in the morning. And in the afternoon, the building didn't have any use, so he did what? He let Paul, I don't know if he gave it to him or he rented the building to him or the church people paid for him to be able to go in and teach. And so Paul was permitted to address uh, you know, all those who had questions in that lecture hall. In fact, they found one extra biblical document, in other words, a document that was not the Bible that actually states that Paul had use of the building from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. So again, there's other evidence that we have written that this really took place other than this are written biblical documents. So in verse 10, it says that this took place for two years so that all who lived in Asia heard the word of God, both Jews and Greeks. So Paul was able to do this for, for two years. And so this is one of the longest places that he'd been able to be there, uh, be at one place. I think his total time there was third, three. So as we move into Acts chapter 19, we see that as we move on, we see that Luke focuses on five different particular incidents. The first is the special miracles, which we'll see. Then he talks about the incidents with the sons of Sceva. Then there's the public burning of the scrolls. Then there's the plan to visit Rome and then the visit of the silversmiths. And so those, that's the five major things. And we're going to hit four of the five here uh, today. So that's what uh, Paul, uh, excuse me, Luke shares with us as far as what happened with Luke. So then we go on to Paul versus the magicians slash evil spirits because he does have confrontation uh, with magicians, but the scripture makes it clear that behind the magicians were evil spirits. So we see in verse 11 and 12 uh, 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 Paul's ministry of miracles. It said, God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul. Now, uh, the way that phrase is coined is written in the original language basically say it wasn't the normal type of miracle. So Luke was using a negative way in the original language to state a positive thing. In other words, Luke was saying this just wasn't an ordinary miracle was going on. So there were ordinary miracles, but what's going on here, Luke says, this is really something. This is extraordinary what God was doing through the Apostle Paul. So it says, so that the handkerchiefs or aprons were even carried from his body uh, to the sick and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. So that handkerchief was basically, they say, it was a small piece of cloth that was uh, basically tied around his head, uh, kind of a towel or a napkin or a face cloth uh, he used to wipe the perspiration. Now remember, Paul was a tent maker. So when he was not teaching, he was making tents and uh, that's how he was making his money besides those who were supporting him. So there were these handkerchiefs or I'm, I'm not sure what you want to call it, headbands that were sweaty. Uh, and they were also taking his aprons. Uh, now, this is where the TV evangelists get this thing. I don't know if you've seen them where they'll, they'll come on and say, if you'll send me, you know, a hundred bucks, I'm going to send you a prayer cloth. And I put my hands, we all put our hands on this prayer cloth and we prayed on it. And, and if you'll send me $100 or whatever, I'll send it to you. And you put it on your ailing part and it's going to make you better. I, have y'all ever seen, have y'all seen that? I mean, I have, but I haven't seen it in a while. But uh, that's, that's where they get this from. Now, number one, that's not what Paul was doing. Paul wasn't saying, here, let me wipe my sweat and go take it out over here to the hospital and wipe it on these people and they'll get healed. That's not what he was doing. What was going on here is that 
God was meeting the people where they were in their particular spiritual progression towards coming to the gospel. And so there was, well, I guess what you might call, they were still, there's some superstition there. They had some thoughts. So God was using, meeting where they were. Again, what God was doing was building up and showing the power of Paul as Paul was being a conduit through which God's power was released. So you see, there's two things going on here. Again, showing the miraculous power of God, which was healing, but also showing that God had chosen Paul in this place, in this time. So again, Paul was not selling his handkerchiefs or socks or aprons to the local uh, faithful. Uh, they were borrowing them and saying, man, this, this is the man who preaches Jesus. And, and again, this was an extraordinary miracle. So uh, then it goes on to say, now notice uh, the handkerchiefs or aprons were, were even carried from his body to the sick. And I want you to underline, and it says, and the diseases left them and the evil spirits went out. I want you to circle those two things because these two things are two individually distinct, different occurrences. And we're going to come back to that uh, in, in our conclusion. Uh, but we need to understand that, uh, that, you know, there are diseases and there are evil spirits. Uh, they're not one and both the same. So then that kind of sets the stage for verses 13 through 19, where we see the Jewish uh, exorcists, verses 13 through 19. But also some of the Jewish, Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who uh, attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. So uh, some of the magicians, okay, there were a lot of magicians. In fact, notice it says the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place. Uh, there were Jews that basically, they were like traveling sideshows. They were, they were traveling salesmen. And it was their gift that they could go and, and they, they believed that they could uh, cast demons out of people. And it was all based on their knowledge of God's name. And that's why, again, remember the, the like Yahweh, they wouldn't write or say God's word. And so people believed because they were Jews, they had a special ability. They had special knowledge of what words could be used over the demons to cast them out. And so it was kind of, I guess, called a shell game or it was just a game, you know, a scam that they were running on these people. And they were, you know, using Hebrew words and doing whatever they could. And so that's why the general populace went to these Jewish exorcists, because, again, they had these knowledge. Now, this is the other thing which is going to come in here in a second when it talks about them burning the scribes. You see, the, Ephesus was a place of a major collection of scrolls and books of casts of spells and conjuration, 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 I believe that's the word. And so Ephesus was a place where there were a lot of magicians. They put a lot of money into buying these books and these scrolls. So they had the special names for which they thought that they could expel demons. So that's, that understanding that moves us over to the end where it talks about the, the, the burning of the scrolls because these people, I mean, it was, it was a lifestyle, it was a profession. And so this is what Paul was going up against. So these folks were going, these Jewish exorcists were going, you know what, if Paul can do it, because they were seeing real exorcism. They said, well, if Paul can do it, we can do it too. So it said, uh, they went to those who had evil spirits, the name of the Lord, Je uh, who had the evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus saying, I adjure you, and that word adjure means I command. I command you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. <laughs> it's like, I command you uh, in, in Charles' name who also Joanne knows. Or actually, it's more, it would be somebody that I don't, Mrs. Johnson, who knows Mr. Johnson, that is somebody they don't, he, in other words, these people didn't know Jesus. The exorcists didn't know Jesus. So again, it was a common trade. And so uh, these were, I guess, kind of renegade Jews that, that dealt with this. So finally, you know, God said, okay, enough's enough. You guys want to deal with the devil? You guys really want to have spiritual warfare? 
you exorcist, then you're, you're going to have it. So, seven sons of one Sceva. Now, this is something, you know, I've read this passage a hundred times, and I don't think I've ever picked up on the fact. Somehow I missed it. It wasn't, you know, you've heard about the demon beating up on that one. I thought it was this one guy. But no, there were seven sons. There were seven exorcists were the sons of the high priest, a Jewish chief priest. Now, the scholars go back. We don't really know if he really was a chief priest or people thought he was a chief priest. But anyway, he was some sort of guy that thought he was up in the Jewish, you know, the, the chain of command. He had seven sons, and his name was uh, Seven Sons of One Sceva, a Jewish chief priest. They were doing this. So they were going out, casting out, and they're the ones that were saying, in the name of Jesus, who also knows Paul, uh, they were doing this. And so they did this on this one man. And the evil spirit answered and said to them. Now notice again, notice the third person plural. Uh, a Jewish priest, they were doing this, and the evil spirit answered and said to them. So it was not one person. It just wasn't one. It was all seven of them. There were seven of them went in there to cast that demon out. And it said, said to them, I recognize Jesus. <laughs> I know about Paul, but who are you? <laughs> I love it. Now, also, it's very interesting. When you look at the original language, the word for recognize is different from the word know about. The word to know, I know Jesus, is gnosko. That means to know by interaction and experience. In other words, the demons, they recognize Jesus. Remember, Jesus was one that had cast out other demons. And, the, you know, the demons know about Jesus. They know he's the son of God. And, you know, uh, they can know without believing. So they know about Jesus. But then even with Paul, it says, now, I've even heard about Paul. The word is epistem episteme, epistemology, to have kind of like knowledge and study of it. But so he, he kind of heard of Paul. I know who Jesus is. And I've heard of Paul, but who are you? <laughs> These boys were out of their league. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on who? On one, on them. He leaped on all seven of them. And overpowered who? One, no, he overpowered them. It's the first time I caught this. Again, it was more than one. He whooped up. I guess that's in East Texas. He whooped up on them. Uh, he overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Um, so basically, the demon caused this possessed man to have supernatural strength. And we've also seen that. Uh, we saw unusual physical power, like in Mark chapter 5. Remember some of the demon-possessed people, that, that guy that was in, you know, could break his chains and do all that in the gospel of Mark. And one scholar put it this way, like an unfamiliar weapon wrongly handled, it exploded in their hands. <laughs> yeah, you just can't use Jesus' name if you, don't, if you don't know him. It was like having a loaded weapon and not knowing how to use it. And so it definitely backfired. You see, they had no right to use Jesus' name. Uh, they did not know Jesus or the power of salvation that was available to them. And so here, very quickly, again, the, the, one of the things we see here from this text that shows us that, again, evil spirits, demon-possessed people can have supernatural power. And so, again, this is what happened and then all of a sudden people are going, whoo, son. <laughs> and this became known to all, both Jews and Greeks. Can you imagine? They didn't even have uh, Twitter. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have any of that stuff. But man, it spread quickly about what these people tried to cast out a demon and they didn't know Jesus and that demon beat up on them. So Jesus' name quickly became very respected in the community. So you see how miracle, again, the purpose of all this is always to glorify God and to lift Jesus up. So, and uh, the fear fell upon them all and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Uh, many also, those who had believed, kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. So as a result of this miracle, as a result of, again, seeing that you just can't put in a, 
quarter and say Jesus' name and pull the, you know, and think you're going to get a miracle. So notice the three things. Uh, those who believe, those who believe in Christ, notice the three things. They kept coming. They kept coming to God. They kept coming. They were confessing. Confessing means they started telling everybody about the evil things they had done. They, all these magicians were coming and going, man, we were just ripping people off. We were doing these things, these evil things in the name of the devil. Uh, they were admitting to doing wrong. So, in other words, great you know, revival was breaking out because they were willing to say, hey, you know, I was just fooling you or I was dealing with the devil. And so, again, great repentance, great confessing was going on in the community. And then, and this is a big thing, and it's, it'd be very easy to overcome, I mean, overcome, over, just glance over it quickly. And they were disclosing their practices. What does that mean? They were telling people about the words that they were using because in the magicians in that community, they believed that the part of their power was secrecy and the secrecy of the words in which they were using to cast out the demons. So in other words, they were making their practices public. They were showing people the books. They were showing people the words they were using. So as a result of disclosing their practices, they were basically saying, I give up my power to do these supernatural things. By making them public, they were, in their mind, losing all power they had of doing these supernatural exorcisms on these individuals. So what do we see here? We see mighty, powerful change in the light, in, in the life, in the lives, in the hearts of people who walked in darkness. Is anybody going to scream or jump a pew or something? Ah, son, I'm serious. I mean, this is major spiritual colliding and clashing and, and the kingdom of God winning. Because people are seeing what? The power of God. They're seeing the miracle of God and what he's doing. And so these people are turning their lives totally over. Um, then verse 19, it says, And many of those who practice magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Now, again, these are scrolls of magic. In fact, uh, several of the scholars talk about uh, there's uh, some museums, I think it's in France, I'm not sure remember exactly what city, but they have copies of these scrolls in these museums that have these scrolls that come from Ephesus. Isn't that cool? So again, it's kind of historical proof and shows that these things really happened and there really were these scrolls. But what these magicians were doing is they were going and they were burning them. In other words, it was a public way of saying, I totally give up what I'm doing. Now, basically, um, a piece of silver, a drachma, in fact, this may be in your footnotes, was a day's wage. So a day's wage, they, they, there are 50,000 pieces of silver. And you do the math, and I believe it's somewhere, it's one scholar, uh, it was something like 143 years worth of wages were burned. Uh, almost all of them said it was worth you know, millions and millions of dollars of what was burned. Because again, these people bought these books in order to have power over the dark. So again, here they were burning the very thing that was giving them their livelihood. But turning to God showed them that they needed to give up those old ways, those old practices, and they needed to start a uh, step from the dark into the light. Wow. Then real quickly, verse 20, progress report. Uh, Luke does this uh, in Acts uh, several times. So the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. So we see this again as a result of all this, the word of God was growing. Then Paul makes plans. I'll just make a brief mention of this in verse 21. It says, now after these things were finished, Paul purposed in the spirit to go to Jerusalem after he'd passed through Macedonia and Acacia saying, after I've been there, I must also see Rome. The thing there, he purposed in the spirit, basically some talk about what does that mean and the difference, and most scholars go with it. Basically, the Holy Spirit had led him in his heart, you know, I, I really need to do these things. And that's about all I'm going to talk about that there is he, God was leading him to move to a different place. So let's close with some lessons learned here. Um, these are very important uh, that we that remember. Number one, going back to Paul being run out of the, the synagogue, we always have to remember that God uses conflict to spread his word. 
you know, they thought they were shutting Paul down, but it was God's will for him to be in school with Tyrannus. And this is the doors that were open. It was another door. And one of the things we've seen, open and closed doors in Paul's ministry and his life the whole time. So uh, sometimes if you get discouraged of conflict and can't go in one direction, look at the direction that God is open. You know, if another direction opens, go, well, you know what? That's where God wants me to go. And, and, and look at God's overall all, uh, sovereignty in your life uh, to know that uh, if, if he's shutting the door there, he's going to open a door somewhere else. Next lesson learned is God heals disease and casts out evil spirits to demonstrate his power so that individuals may turn to him in faith and receive salvation. Bottom line, miracles, purpose of miracles is to glorify God. The reason to glorify God is to do what? It's so people will turn their hearts and accept Christ. That is the purpose of miracles. A miracle for a miracle's sake is not what Jesus ever did, not what any of the apostles did. The miracles were to do what? To draw attention to God. And so we need to remember that, yes, God still heals today. He definitely heals and God still casts out evil spirits, but we must be mindful and careful of those who say, you know, I have the gift of healing and I'm going to have a sideshow about it and look at me and I'm going to wave my coat and 50 people are going to fall down and, I'm, and they're going to be healed from my great healing ministry. Now, you know, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. All I know, that's not what I see in the Bible as, as, as far as the biblical understanding of, of when people are healed. It's never for a sideshow. It, it's never for calling attention to the person who's performing the act. It should never, when a, if a person has a gift of healing, and you've heard me probably say this before, I think that they should go in the hospitals. I think they should go in the nursing homes. I think they should go in the assisted living. If someone has a gift of healing, man, I hope somebody does. They need to go in these hospitals and heal these sick people, especially now with this, you know, the second surge, third surge, uh, Delta variant. Man, we need God to give somebody the gift of healing to heal these people. So I'd very def so do that. That's biblical. But having, you know, putting up a circus tent and and making it all about you and your that that doesn't seem to me in line with what I see in the scripture. Other than casting out evil spirits. Some people make a big deal, they got a ministry of casting out. Well, you know what? That that's not, you know, these things happen. I mean, Paul didn't go looking for it. You know, but he dealt with it when it came into, into his line of where God was taking him. And again, what's the whole purpose in healing people? What's the whole point in casting out evil spirits? Is it to have a side show? No, it's so that people may turn to him in faith and receive salvation. If you can grasp that concept, if you can understand that, that will everything, a lot of other things will just make a whole lot of sense with what other people are doing. Because everything about miracles, again, you look in the Gospels, you look at what Paul did, miracles are to help people believe. And yes, I still believe in miracles. And I especially believe that God does mission, uh, miracles on the mission field. And you're going to hear uh, Anna and Thomas next week, they're going to they're be taking this, this teaching time and sharing about what God's been doing, uh, you know, overseas. And so, again, God does miracles and and. You know, very definitely. And I think he does them in these situations where particularly so people can come to faith. Next lesson learned. Demon possession and disease are two different problems. And you're going to go, well, duh, pastor. But in my experience through the years, uh, I have had individuals. When I was in high school, uh, I came upon them. There was a minister in a church and this doing Bible study and stuff. And uh, he basically didn't believe in evil spirits. Uh, a pastor of a, a large congregation, he didn't believe in evil spirits. Uh, he basically said all the uh, demon possession in the New Testament was simply medical problems. And I didn't know anything about the Bible. I didn't know what from this for that. And that, that didn't even set right with me then. And I had no training or, you know, but there, there, are, there are individuals and in, in, in groups of uh, people on a particular theological bent that they don't believe in necessarily the supernatural or there, or there is spiritual warfare. Uh, then there's also those, I've also been told that all medical problems are founded in demon possession. What? 
You know, every illness is either because of, of your lack of faith or you're possessed or oppressed by a demon. That's crazy. I mean, our bodies break down. Our bodies have problems. Now, yes, you know, demons can throw stuff at us, but, you know, you got the Holy Spirit. You don't have to worry about that. But this is where, again, there too, and again, I'm, this is maybe oversimplification, and maybe you've never had to deal with this. But from the Bible, we see what happened. He dealt, what did Paul deal, deal with? What was healed? Those who were sick with diseases and those who were demon-possessed. So from a biblical perspective, we understand there are two separate cases. Are you with me? So don't let somebody say, oh, you're sick, you must have a demon. Well, go, no, I think you've got a demon up your nose. No, don't, well, maybe you can say, that, you know, that's not right. And, and vice versa. And so anyway, this, you know, made enough an impact on me for me to remember that, I, you know, God put it in my heart to share with you to make sure that you understand there's two separate things. Now, next thing is very obviously from the sons of Sceva, don't take spiritual warfare lightly. Yeah, we're going to go out looking under the bushes and go to cast out some demons today. We're just going to do that and, you know, go, go fishing after that. No, listen, don't go looking for trouble. Don't, you know, evil spirits, they exist. They're here today, you know, they're out there. Don't go looking for trouble. Now, you know, and I'm sure maybe God calls certain people to the certain ministries. Uh, don't go say, well, yeah, I'm just going to go read a scripture verse and this really mean purple person and cast out that demon. Uh, no, just <laughs> remember this passage. Spiritual warfare is very serious. And uh, I've had a few occurrences uh, uh, dealing with people and like this, and it's, it's no light matter. So don't just think you can, you know, pop a top and go cast out a demon while, you know. No, this is very serious spiritual stuff. Uh, don't be like the sons of Sceva, which I know that you're not. But, you know, uh, the point was that only in the power of Jesus' name and the blood of Jesus can, you know, and, uh, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, can you overcome these kinds of uh, spiritual warfare? So uh, just, just don't go looking for it. it <laughs> spiritual warfare, if you're living as a Christian, it will find you. Don't worry about that. Then last of all, the gospel and the application of its message are powerful and effective weapons in opposing the forces of darkness. So if, if you want to do spiritual warfare, you know what the best thing you can do? Share Jesus. Don't go looking for those you know, dark alleys and you're going <laughs> to whoop up on some demon. Yeah, that, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. But you know what you can do? You can share Jesus with somebody. You can talk about the application of the, of the message. Hey, if you accept Christ, you're going to have eternal life forever. If you accept Christ, you're going to have forgiveness of sins. Your, your sin and your shame is going to be gone. You're going to be cleansed. You're going to have a clean conscience. You're going to have power from the Holy Spirit. See what I'm talking about? Isn't that, that's powerful there. That's what changes lives. Focus on Jesus, the gospel, and, and that will take care in and of itself. A person who lives in darkness, they'll see the light and say, yes, I want Jesus. <clears throat> so that's how we should focus our attention on these, these worlds colliding. Walk in Jesus, talk about Jesus. And, 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 and that's what's going to get us through. That's, that's what gives us the victory. You know, keep our eyes on Jesus, walk, on, walk with Jesus, and talk about Jesus. I guess I could have said those three things and we could have closed about a half hour ago. But man, isn't that a great passage in, Ephesus, in, in Acts about Ephesus? Man. And I think, again, that, that's a picture. There's this, you know, there is spiritual warfare going all around. I mean, you know, this COVID thing, spiritual warfare, and uh, so... We need, I again, encourage you, you know, to pray, spend time in the word, and tell people about Jesus. You know, people need Jesus more than ever. I, this is not, I'm not going to get wound up on the second soapbox, but uh, again, I'm seeing as, as, uh, as this is historically documented, uh, you know, in uh, August of 2021, as, as there's a second surge here in Austin, Texas, uh, people need God more than ever. Uh, there's just a polarization. People, it just seems like the mean people get meaner and the nice people get nicer and just the clash over, 
you know, mass, no mass, vaccine, no mass. Can't we just love each other and support each other and, and, and not tell people, you know, it's like you do what you got to do, but let's, you know, let's be safe for everybody. Uh, let's, let's love. Let's turn our freedom in an opportunity. Remember that sermon back on 4th of July? Let's, let's turn our uh, freedom in an opportunity to serve and help people. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this incredible passage. Thank you for uh, moving in Luke's heart through the Holy Spirit to, to write about all that Paul went through. And Lord, as we saw in his letter to the church in Ephesus, just uh, uh, the things that he was facing as far as the spiritual warfare. Lord, just thank you that when we have Jesus in our hearts and we're filled with your Holy Spirit, that we don't have to be concerned uh, we can just know the devil's going to throw uh, things at us. He's, his darts are going to uh, be hitting at us, but we know by faith. And if we walk by faith and keep our eyes on Jesus, that we're just going to keep moving forward. And Lord, that we don't have to fear it because greater is he who is in us than he is in the world. Help us never to be afraid. Help us to be wise. Uh, help us to be uh, loving. And help us, again, just to uh, think about Jesus, talk about Jesus and, and walk for Jesus in our lives. God, thank you for this time, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Thank you.